the morning. All right, let's get into it. You know, I don't waste no time. Okay, so racial religious imagery and psychological confusion. We have spent much of the last 100 years since legal emancipation fighting for what has been the surface of the problem. Because we were operating at the surface, we had, no, we had no sooner cut down the upper limbs of racial oppression that the underbrush grew back, consuming us again. Our problems were literally sissy, sissy fian, perpetually rolling the stone of social, political, and psychologically resolution to the top, only to have it roll down and we begin the difficult cycle all over again. You may read books such as The Strange Career of Jim Crow by C. Van Woodward and discover that what is happening in the social and political environment right now at, at the close of the 20th century are essentially the same events which were occurring at the close of the 19th century. There was a similar time about 100 years ago when Africa, when African American people thought that freedom had been acquired with political and enfranchisement and the aid of other people helping us to set up our agenda. We had more African Americans in position of political power 100 years ago than we actually have today. Reconstruction in South in the South produced more political presence for African Americans than we have had since. The presence of African and Amer African Americans in positions of political power throughout the southern United States and even in northern parts was a common occurrence before the end of the 1800s. In less than 10 years time, the Jim Crow laws were enacted and we found ourselves in almost the same political condition that we were in prior to 1865 or worse. After 1865, we had the illusions of freedom, which made the disenfranchisement even more cruel to the slave who was clearly defined as without rights. It took almost 100 years to get Jim Crow laws removed to bring us right back where we were 100 years before. Then alone comes the political changes of the 1980s and 1990s, which have threatened to reverse many of the political gains made in the prior two decades. These changes are combined with a mentally, I'm, I'm sorry, these changes are combined with a mentality that is not unlike the heavy racist one that has reached fever pitch at the time of establishment of the Jim Crow laws. Uh, the fact that the clock can be so easily turned back and we repeatedly find ourselves trying to correct the problems which were supposedly resolved may suggest that we were, are not appropriately recognizing and or dealing with the real problems. Such relapses would not occur if we were not perhaps dealing with the symptoms of the problem or superficial manifestations of a deeper problem, which like the weed, those roots is left intact, soon rises again to choke the life from the garden of progress. The nature of our problem is quite serious and represents a deeply embedded psychological disturbance. We need something more than aspirin to remove the symptoms.
We need massive correct corrective surgery in the brain, on the brain. Oh, excuse me. Oh, I apologize, my nose. Anyway, so um, religious imagery. Modern students and scholars of the mind have not adequately dealt with the influence of religious symbols and imagery on the thinking of people. Certainly, ancient students of psychological, of psychologically, particularly those of the Nile Valley civilization in ancient Africa, devoted considerable attention to the significance of symbols and images on the minds of people. In fact, the massive symbol which stands as monuments of this great civilization, such as the Sphinx, the pyramids, and the obliques. Um, obelisk, 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 were constructed with the specific intention of creating powerful and compelling images in the consciousness of people. Perhaps the European psychologic, psychologist Carl Jung is a distinct exception to his European colleagues, and he's devoted considerable discussion and theor theoretical speculation regarding the importance of symbols in general and religious symbols, in particular on the thinking of human beings. He urged for their relevance to psychological and mental well-being and also identified the impact of their absence or distortion. distortion. Jung did not, nor do any other European-American psychologists, 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 discuss the specific impact of these racial religious images on the sites of black people. It is important to keep in the mind that the images of God, which a people or a person possesses, will determine the political limits of their minds. If people have a narrow image of God, then their minds are narrow. If people believe that the biggest reality is a tree, then that is the extent to which their minds can aspire. If one believes that God can be only as large as the river or a lake, then that is as large as the mind will be able to reach. Such an image prohibits you from conceiving of the ocean which feeds the lake. And if you cannot conceive of the clouds which feed the ocean, your potential for understanding truth and the comp competence which comes from truth is limited. People with a limited or narrow concept of God then have an automatically limited and narrow psychology. Good morning. How you doing, Natasha? I said it wrong, Natasha. <laughs> Look, girl. <laughs> if you have come from a small rural town and you have only played against 140 pound football players and you won your varsity letter every year, that you really believe that you have great powers within that limited context. If you happen to find yourself at a major university where the lightest man on the team is 200 pounds, suddenly you are forced into another reality because your point of comparison was with 140 pounders. Your capabilities are only understood within that limited context. If you were capable of doing more, you would not know it until you got into a broader sphere. There is a young man I know who is a triple jumper on the university track team. For the entire year, he had been trying to jump further than his record he had set in the region, which was 52 feet. In each meet, his competition would jump 47, 49, or 50 feet. He could not go beyond 52 feet because 52 was the best that he could do under the pressure that were available, under the pressures that were available. And his own record was the best image that he could find to influence him. He eventually went to the national meets 
and the fifth place jumper jumped 53 feet. You can imagine what his first, second, third, and fourth place jumpers um, had done. Suddenly, this young man who had desperately reached for greater distance all year long jumped 52 feet, six inches, surpassing everything he had been able to jump all year. And he did it repeatedly through the entire meet. Good morning. What had happened for the friend was that his imagination had been expanded by his experience with bigger images and his capacities had consequently been expanded. The implication of this, that the mind's possibilities are limited by its concepts of its potential. Human potential is broadened or limited by its concept of God. Thus, if God is anything finite, that is limited. If God is anything that is limited, then you have every already limited your mind. However, if God is infinite without limits, with um, without boundaries, without defeases or definition, always greater than you, you have already expanded your mind to reach for the limits of all things. Such a consciousness of God puts us into the proper field to grow to our greatest heights. This idea constitutes the basic reason why any finite image of God is in fact limiting, limiting to our psychology. The problem only multiplies as we begin to attribute other limited characteristics to the deity. But to have a concept of God that can be put into a limited frame, a limited image, or a limited idea automatically limits what your mind can do and where your mind can go. Imam Warif Dean Muhammad once said, once stated in a public lecture that if you can put God into a frame, then you have got him and he does not have you. He continued, if you can hang him up on your wall, he belongs to you. You do not belong to him. You can take his picture, put it in a frame, lock him up in a room, and do whatever you want to do. However, if God is going to be the root, however, if God is going to be God, the ruler, the creator, the maker of all things, he cannot be put into a limited frame. The question from a the question of a particular characteristic begins to raise a whole variety of questions. We could develop a discussion around any number of problems, which arise from the anthropomorphic idea that is creating God in man's image. For example, there are considerable problems in making the deity man as opposed to the woman. If God is just a male, that means there are 50% of human possibilities that God is not. This means that you have cut off God's possibilities and limited your concept. You have introduced an unnatural psychology into those who are women who would see themselves less favored because God is of a different gender. gender. The purpose of this discussion is to look at a particular characteristic that has been assigned to God and some of the consequences of that set of characteristics on the psychology of people everywhere that this image has gone. We want to study the impact of racial characteristics which have been attributed to God. Impact on the psychology of the portrayed race. There is a serious psychological problem created for the person portrayed in the form of the divine image. Since the focus of our discussion will be the impact of those, will be the impact on those who are not so portrayed, it is important to begin with this perspective to suggest that the problem is clearly not unidirectional. The person who looks up to, to ah, the person who looks up and sees his physical characteristics shared by the deity begins to develop the idea that he is exactly like God. 
or that God is limited to be like him. This is all right if one sees potential for growth within the idea. The confusion of the physical attributes with the very nature of God begins to make the person feel that his particular physical features have endowed him with automatic claims to divinity. Such a person can begin to believe in his own mind that I am the God, I am the deity, I am the creator. He begins to believe that the blonde hair and the blue eyes on the portrait are his qualifications for divinity. This begins to cultivate an ego maniac. Such a person begins to suffer from ego inflation. This serves to create a monster incapable of correction or growth since they see themselves as already perfect. Such thinking is a very characteristic of paranoid persons. Those people who believe that everybody or somebody is out to get them, which they explain as a consequence of their being superior to other people. They seriously misrepresent themselves, overstating their own importance. This is a major characteristic of the mind which begins to believe it is actually the God. Hitler, possessed by the image of a blue-eyed, blind-haired deity, was convinced that the Aryan race was the superior race that everybody else needed to be destroyed and that everybody else needed to be destroyed. Napoleon could not rest until he had conquered and subdued the whole world because he felt that he was like the Caucasian image that was exhibited throughout his society. We can look at the country, <clears throat> after country, Belgium, Portugal, France, England, an empire where the sun never used to set, and we find Maniac, maniacal conquerors who felt they had a divine right to rule because they were like God. This is revealed in their conviction that conquering the necessary to civilize a heathen, pagan, barbaric world, meaning that anybody who doesn't look like us is heathen because we are the ones who are the gods. They were possessed by an unnatural and deluded image of themselves. From the Amazon to the so-called Middle East, we still find this assertion assertion of divine right to own and rule. They think they are God. In Palestine, some refugees from Europe walked in and said, God said, this is our land. This is our promised land. Our God promised it to us. He looked like us and carries our national identity. This is our homeland, and you are supposed to give in and submit. The ultimate story is that the image or concept of God being like a particular people endows them with an unnatural perspective on themselves and others. Oops. Oh, God. Now, let us look at this very carefully. We do not want to suggest that God should not be conceived as one who can impact all people in any conditions. We do not want to believe that somehow God is incapable of elevating all people, all men and women, can be reached by God. We should not confuse God's ability to reach all of us with the belief that we are God. The problem that has been created for the Euro-American mind, which has led him to become an imperialist, a slave master, a colonist, an oppressor around the world, is rooted in the idea that man may believe he was the Caucasian image that he had identified as God. He believed this gave him the power and the right to do whatever he wanted. This destroyed their natural human Humility. And their submissiveness 
submissiveness to the superior God force. The idea of what supremacy suggests to Caucasian minds that they are the superior by nature. One of the things that helps human beings modify their conducts naturally is an understanding that though they have great strength, they also have real limitations. Good morning, Kazo. One of the things that lets human beings chrome back into balance is, the, is a realization that there are things which naturally limit them. If you go too long, if you run too hard, you get tired and you have to come back and get some rest. If you eat too much, you get a stomach ache. And if you know you should not eat so much, um, and you know you should not eat so much, if you watch television too long, you get a headache, and you know you should not watch so much of it. But once people get an inflated idea of who they are and what they are, they do not have the capacity to naturally correct themselves. They begin to do things that ultimately destroy themselves. One of the reasons that the use of intoxicants has led to so many disasters is because drunken drivers lose their natural capacity to correct themselves. Drunk drivers find themselves going 80 miles per hour and they feel like they are only going 40 miles per hour. The drivers see a stop sign and think it is, a, it is two, way, two blocks away. It's too late when they realize that they are upon it. They run the sign, hit and kill someone, and then the mistake is realized. The sober person with a realistic sense of who they are are able to say, okay, here's a sign, let me stop. They see it, respond to it, act and do what is necessary. They're equipped to naturally correct themselves and regulate their behavior. But one of the things that happens when people unrealistically perceive what they are they begin to create a situation whereby they cannot naturally correct themselves. Uh, the European world is on the verge of self-destruction because it is no longer, because it no longer has the capacity to correct itself. It has gotten somehow consumed by its own consumption because it cannot naturally correct and regulate itself. It has made itself hated by nations around the world because it cannot naturally correct its addiction to access, to excess. They are drunk on the idea of being like the image that they portray as God. All right, now, the effect of racial images on African Americans. For African Americans, racial religious imagery is even more devastating. We have demonstrated that the one who sees himself in the divine image is given an unnatural and a very inflated notion of what he or she is, which develops a kind of egotistical maniac, which is even worse. Though it is what happens to the one who is not portrayed in the divine imagery and who worships a non-self image, in Judeo-Christian imagery, the Caucasian bows down and worships himself. And the African-American worships the Caucasian as a god as well. Over a hundred years ago, a brilliant African Christian theologian and student of the social sciences wrote a very important document. It is a document that has been obscured by time because of the revolutionary and important insights contained in the document. Even African-American historians have failed to deal seriously with one of the most perceptive and brilliant historians <sighs> in modern times. The Cambridge graduate Edward Blyden wrote the document entitled Islam, Christianity, and the Negro in 1888. He observed, No one can deny the great aesthetic and moral advantages which have occurred 
to the Caucasian race from Christian art. Through all of its stages of development, from the good shepherd of the catacombs to the transfiguration of Raphael, Raphael, whatever, the same thing, from Rolf Mosaic to the annex to the inexpressible delicacy and beauty of Giotto and Fra Angela, Angelico, but to the Negro, all these exquisite representations exhibit only the physical characteristics of a foreign race. And while they tended to quicken the taste of refined and sensible of what Caucasian race, they had only a depressing influence upon Negro, upon the Negro, who felt that he had neither part nor lot so. Sorry if it don't sound like it's making sense. Um, upon the Negro who felt that he had neither part nor lot for as far as his physical characteristics was concerned in these splendid representations, a strict adherence to the letter of the second commandment would have been no drawback to the Negro. So to him, the painting and sculpture, painting and sculpture of the Europe as instruments of education has been worse than failures. They have raised barriers in the way of his normal development. They have been, they have set before him models of imitation and his very effort to conform to the canyons of taste. Thus, practically suggested has impaired, if not destroyed his self-respect and has made him the weakening and creeper when he appeared to Christian land. It was our lot not long ago to hear an illiterate Negro in the prayer meeting in New York entreat the deity to extend his lily white hands and bless the waiting congregation. Another, let me see if I can unplug my phone now because I can't barely see. Oh, oh, God. I can barely see what I'm reading. Okay. All right, that's better. Another, another with um, no greater amount of culture, preaching from John 3, 2, we shall be like him, etc. He exclaimed, brethren, image a imagine a beautiful white man with blue eyes, rosy cheeks, and flaxen hair, and we shall be like him. The conceptions of those worshipers were what they gathered from plastic and pictorial representation, as well as from the characteristics of the dominant race around them. It is important to note that Dr. Blyden, over a hundred years ago, was writing about the problem we are continuing to face today. The most obvious problem, which comes from the experience of seeing God in, in an image of somebody other than yourself, is that it creates an idea that the image represented is superior and you are inferior. Once you have a concept that be, um, begins to make you believe you are not as good as other people based upon the assumptions we have already established, your actions follow your mind. If you have your mind set in a certain way, your behavior follows precisely the program of your mind. The content of this program determines who we are and what we are. So if you have internalized the view of the deity and the creator as being, <clears throat> as being in flesh, having a nationality and physical characteristics different from yourself, then you automatically assume that you are inferior in your own characteristics. The sense of inferiority is not in the form of natural humility, which we discussed, but you begin to believe you have less human potential than the one who looks like the image, the image, which is white.
blonde hair and blue eyes. The stage is now set for the cycle of self-fulfilling prophecy. You believe they are superior and you are inferior. And sure enough, you will start acting inferior. You begin to dress inferior. You begin to feel inferior. You begin to think inferior. You begin to have families that are inferior. You become economically inferior. You become academy, academically inferior. You begin to follow the program, the first psychological necessity of making someone into a slave is to make the person believe he or she ought to be a slave. One of the methods for making someone act in an inferior way is to convince him or her psychologically that he, she is inferior. Once that is done, the job is completed because people proceed to live out the prophecy that they that the prophecy just as they should. This stands as the foundation of many other kinds of problems that such a people will face. Mm. What's interesting is that Euro-American psychologists are fully aware of the impact that other images have on people's self-esteem. The psychological literal, I mean, literature well documents this phenomenon. Research by both Euro-American and psychologists and their students and certain African-American psychologists such as Dr. Kenneth Clark support this notion. As far as back as 1939, Dr. Clark and his wife did a study and demonstrated that little black children as early as preschool faced a major psychological problem. They did not like being black and did not like see and did not like see being black in a very positive light. The Clarks gave the three year old children black dolls and white dolls and asked them, which of the dolls is pretty? The children chose the blonde hair and blue eye Caucasian doll then asked which doll is so is smart. The response was the same, Caucasian doll. Asked which one would you like to look like? The same one asked which one is ugly? The one that looked like the three-year-old black child was selected. This study was published in 1939. Ironically, this problem has been here for a very long time. Ooh, excuse me. Make sure I ain't got no booties. Okay. Okay, had no boogies. <laughs> All right, where was I? Um, all right, there we go. In the 1960s, a change came about. One of the first things that the black activists began to question was the fact that the textbooks, the actors on TV, and in the movies, even the man mannequins in the stores' windows did not look like them. They still don't. Did not look like them. The black sociologists, <clears throat> psychologists, theologic theologians, and educators said, we must change these textbooks and make the books 
have characters that look like us. Hundreds of concerned black scholars and activists produced all kinds of data to show that the school books needed not only Little White Dick Jane and Spot, but they needed little black children as well. Everyone in the department store, merchants to Hollywood producers, were warned that blacks would not patronize them if our images were not represented in their products. Justifiably, we wanted black faces wherever African American people were being influenced. The seriousness of, of the Caucasian religious imagery is revealed by the realization of the absence of concern about these images. Almost not one dealt with the representation of God in all of the heavenly host in Caucasian flesh. They objected to Santa Claus. They objected to the Dick and Jane characters with no bl um, black playmates. They objected to the fact that there were no lawyers, no doctors, no nurses, no professional people on the television. They objected to all these things, but they did not object to the fact that their children were sitting down at two year old and younger being taught this man with blonde hair, blue eyes, pale skin is the savior of the world who died for your sins and is your God. Black children sit at their dinner tables where a black daddy and black mama have often overcome racist opposition to provide them with food. And over the table, there hangs a picture to which they bow their heads, looking at 12 Caucasians sitting around their table at the Last Supper. There sits God's son and all of his closest companions and not even the cook, the server, or the busboy is shown to look like the black family on whose wall this image hangs. God's mother, the Madonna, is Caucasian and all of the God's friends are portrayed as Caucasian. Michelano, Angel, um, Michael, I'm sorry. <laughs> Michael Angelo went all the way and portrayed God himself in the ceiling of the sustained chapel with a long white beard to match his long white face and his the heavenly host were all portrayed in the same flesh. Few people saw this as a problem. Instead, our activists attacked the problem of Dick and Jane books, mannequin, mannequins or soap operas. There was a real hesitancy to address the problem worse manifestation in the church. Perhaps the most disturbing fact is that this Caucasian image of divinity has become an unconsciously controlling factor in the psychology of African Americans. Brilliant scholars of the mind, usually effectively critical, were unable to see this influence. Their fear of a mental barrier against recognizing, um, sorry, their fear of accepting it even after it was pointed out, demonstrated to the presence of a mental barrier against recognizing this issue. Some of the most verbal critics of racism and its consequences have been, uh, have been thoroughly incapable of addressing this issue. The evidence of the controlling influence of these images is in the inability of even the most radical thinkers to openly challenge what they had come to believe unconsciously was actually the image of God. Now, if the experts had this problem, just imagine what your poor grandmother would have to endure. Imagine what your 12 year old son is dealing with when he has already endured 11 years of Sunday school pictures. Imagine your personal dilemma when you must challenge your long held image of the very face of God let us understand that this problem has to be removed from the root. The image of God as a Caucasian is so pervasive in the society that even one who may have never been in a church would still be severely influenced by the image. The assignment of particular characteristics to the creator is one of the most destructive ideas in the world today. This is probably why even the, the sacred Judeo-Christian scriptures, specifically 
enjoin thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath that is in the water underneath earth thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them and the quran states say o people of the book come to common terms as between us and you that we worship none but god that we associate no partners with him that we erect not from among ourselves lords and patrons other than god let us look at another quote from edward blyden in this regard wherever the negro is found in christian land his lending trace is not docility instead it is severe civility he is slow and unprogressive individuals here and there may be found an extraordinary intelligence enterprise and energy but there is no christian community of negroes anywhere which is self-reliant and independent. On the other hand, there are numerous Mohammedan communities and states in Africa which are self-reliant, productive, independent, and dominant, supporting without the contents, countenance or patronage of the parent county country, Arabia, whence they derive their political literacy and ecclesiastical institutions. So it is said here a hundred years ago by a Christian theologian that the images of Christianity handicapped the productivity of non-white people accepting and worshiping white images of divinity. Once you begin to believe that the deity is somebody other than you, then you are put into a psychological dependent state that renders you incapable of breaking loose until, uh, until you break the hold of that image. Although we are 100 years out of slavery, we still govern none of the institutional forces that affect our lives. There is no successful independent black African American institution that is independent both in thought and economic control of the euro-american ideas institutions yep the frightening fact is that we control absolutely nothing our token present on the city council's mayor, uh, mayoral offices or religious organizations does not mean that we are in control. We do not control the water flowing into the faucets. We do not control the lights. We do not control the buildings. We do not control the paved streets. We do not control the gas, the food. We do not control anything that affects our lives. Neither do we control the basic agenda or direction of any of these institutions. Unfortunately, we often do not care that we don't control anything. And furthermore, <laughs> We are defiant and preserving our dependence. If someone comes along and says, be independent, <laughs> you say, oh, you are a radical militant, revolutionary, get out of here. That person's making such a suggestion, that person making such a suggestion is simply saying that what mama bird says to its baby birds 10 days after you were born, and that is stand on your own, fly. If we, say, if we say that to people 100 years up from slavery and 20,000 years into civilization, they respond, I don't want to do anything like that. We begin to glorify dependence. We have become comfortable being governed by someone else. We are constantly looking for someone else to govern us. Our dependent mentality and actual fear of autonomy leads us to even identify heroes on the basis of their, of their dependence. The hero for us is one who begs more effectively than others. Our heroes are not admired for their dependent th independent thinking. We do not respect those people who are most effective in articulating our uniqueness and our capability for self-sufficiency. Instead, we revere people who, 
who prostrate themselves to other men on our behalf and gain, and gain the approval of our oppressors. Distinguished African-American leaders such as Marcus Garvey and Elijah Muhammad are either ignored or condemned because they called for an independent view of ourselves as people. Men such as these are treated as minor figures against great heroes who begged us into participation in European American culture and institutions. Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Patrick Henry, and other Euro-American heroes were people who advocated American independence at all costs, even from their own mother country. <laughs> Any African American who makes a similar demand for African American people is viewed who is viewed with suspicion or hostility or hostility. The reason for this, at least in part, is because the psychological dependence which has been for, uh, fostered by acceptance of these images of God as Caucasian. Acceptance of the image, thank you. Acceptance of this image makes it almost impossible to entertain an image of self-managed cultural, economic, or political life. People free of this influence do this quite naturally and quite successfully. Of course, unchecked independence can lead to anarchy and imperialism. Those who identify with the image of God as self feel as self feel confident and correct in exploiting the resources of others, which such a mentality, one can comfortably take control over another's resources because they feel that they have divinely given rights to do so. On the other hand, those under the influence of the alien images feel that they have no claim on the re or any resources the consequence is a persisting dependency which comes from the mentality that sees the creator as being identified with another group one of the persisting difficulties facing african-american people is the difficulty to think independently We are constrained by the perception that creativity and innovation are the exclusive privileges, privileges, privilege of those who are similar to the image of divinity. Our scholars are limited to imitating the scholars of independent Caucasian thinkers. We analyze our situation and the nature of the world in general exclusively from the frame of reference of euro americans which approach the solution of the problems as if the nature of the problems of the former slave and descendants of african civilization are the same with those or former of former slaves masters and immigrants from europe the consequence is a persistence of the more devastating problem that we have as a people social economic political and motivational the image of the creator sets the tone for the potential of the creativity in the human sphere those who are alienated from the image of the creator do not attribute strong characteristics of creativity to themselves therefore productivity can be um can at its best be imitative of those who are viewed to be the image of the creator. Again, the problem stems from the stifled independence based upon the psychological uh, straitjacket of seeing God portrayed as another than oneself. Lacking in creativity, we are unable to go into our own experience and reap the benefits of our God-given gifts. We laud fruit fell to see the value of our own psychological effectiveness and enduring the psychological traumas experienced collectively as an oppressed people. We adore Marx, but fail to realize 
the superiority superiority of our own intuit of our intuitive economic concepts, which gave us economic sustenance through unity with minimal resources and in defiance of the Marx dialect, we proclaim Dewey's educational psychological um, philosophy. We proclaim Dewey's educational philosophy while failing to articulate the dynamics of the feet of our own education in an environment which prohibited our very literacy. Our failure to study our own experiences and utilize the benefits of that experience is a clear defect in our social effectiveness. Our lack of confidence in our unique experiences and reality has its roots in our perceptions that we do not have equal access to the presence of the creator because he does not look like us. Persistently, persistently hunted by the, this image of divine, we consistently seek out leaders or authorities who resemble the appearance of the Caucasian image of divinity. The real irony is the number of highly educated and intellect, intelligent African Americans who are literally locked in intellectually to the authority and intellectual leadership of non-African people. The authority maybe Marx for Skinner, Gloria Steetham, or the Pope. But the underlying basis for the legitimacy of this expert is his or her similarity to the Caucasian, relig Caucasian religious images. This is not, however, to discredit the presence of viable and effective ideas in each of these and many other European and non-African thinkers, people are no more denied access to the truth by their color than they are given chosen access to the truth by their color. One problem for African American advancement as people is our tendency to reject the authority and leadership of those who do not have Caucasian features. Ugh. And we rather faithfully and uncritically accept the leadership or authority of anyone who possesses those features. It is almost as if people with African features cannot be authorities unless they have been authenticated and credentialed by the highest European or Caucasian authorities. Only then is the non-Caucasian person viewed as an authority. The only exception to this rule is the situation of the fundamentalist minister who has claimed to claim to authority is that he has been called. He then identifies the voice of, the, of his calling as being precisely the same Caucasian figure who can wash you whiter than snow. This called representative is the given unbridled authority even when he may not represent the self-interested um, interests of people he is leading. The divine representative can lead this divine representative can then have the legitimacy of the Caucasian God who has so highly rever um, revered. The point is the same. Whether one is authorized by Harvard or a call, the source of legitimization is identical. Although the focus of this discussion has been on the situation of African Americans, it is just as true in other cultures where the European Caucasian image of divinity has gone. The African nations most strongly under the influence of this alien image are least effective in determining their own destiny. They all have experts from the other nations telling them what to do, not only with their technology, but with their religion, their social political philosophy as well. They have limited ability to exercise autonomy and self-government and in respect for indigenous leadership because the highest authority has been identified in non-African appearance. Dr. Edward Blyden makes another relevant observation on the impact of elevating the Caucasian image of God. 
the Christian Negro, abnormal in his development, pictures God and all beings remarkable for their moral and intellectual qualities with the physical characteristics of European and deems it an honor if he can approxim approxim um, mates by a mixture of his blood, however irregularly achieved in outward appearance, at least to the idea thus forced him upon the physical accompaniments of all excellence in the way in this way he loses that sense of dignity of human nature observable in his Mohammedan brother in other words dr blighton is suggesting that those christians who have taken on the idea that the only way to be excellent is to be like a caucasian are the same people who believe the only qualities which are civilized qualities are those associated with Caucasians, standards of the excellent in family life, cultural life, moral life, dress manners, language, and everything are identified with them. There is no dignity in being oneself, suggests Dr. Blyden. Too often, the conclusion is reached that the absence of these qualities among African Americans and the persisting aping of European mannerisms and cultural represents the fundamental deficiency in the conduct in the conduct of African people. The argument suggesting an innate and genetically determined intellectual deficit among black people are extensive and compelling. Many of these qualities of self negation and inadequate social development of African people with a European context can be attributed directly as a consequence of the issue of this discussion. In this regard, Imam Warf Dean Muhammad raises a penetrating question. Ugh. What would happen to the minds of Caucasian people if black people would suddenly come into power with their mentality and with their love for religion? What would happen if nappy-headed black Jesuses were put all over their land and throughout their homes and in their home in their churches what would happen to their minds all over the period of 300 years if they kept coming to churches seeing our images as their redeemer seeing our image as their prophets their apostles their angels they would be reduced to inferiority because the image before them of the supreme model of superiority would be black and not white. Imam Muhammad places the prophet, I'm sorry, places the problem in the broader context of the psychological process in this hypothetical image. The image of this Caucasian image on the psyches of non-Caucasian people is no worse than would be the influence of a black image on the psyches of non-black people. The reductions of people to state of inferiority represents a reprehensible form of mind control of the worst kind. It also becomes the basis of ensuring the continued psychological enslavement of any people under such influence. The solution, there are two modes of attack on the psychologically crippling influence faced by non-white people in Christian societies. One mode of attack involves the removal of the images of the outer world and the second involves the removal of the internalized image from the inner being. The removal of these images from the outer world was initiated in the late 1970s by the thrust of Ayman W.D. Muhammad and the CRAID, um, C-R-A-I-D, Committee, which stands for a Committee for the Removal of All Images that Portray the Divine, that Portray Divine. Efforts of the American Muslim Mission by protest flyers, public rallies, 
and publications direct social action was taken to raise the critical this critical issue among religious people there is probably no more significant efforts of the social reform than this effort to remove all images and all racial effects from worship such political activity has real relevance in correcting the environment's contribution to the problem which we have discussed previously removing the images from the uh, society can clearly protect the young children from the influence of such images we can protect them from this influence on their thinking which makes them view themselves in the distorted and unnatural way the protection will serve young caucasian minds who develop an unnaturally inflated image of their self-worth as well as the young non-caucasian mind which sees themselves as inferior because of these images Ooh, I'm, I'm almost done i'm on the last page that's it in the late 1980s bishop george augustus stallings at this time an african-american priest in washington dc began to challenge the roman catholic church about its role in perpetrating the white supremacist images his active attempt to reflect african cultural experiences and lit liturgy images and um, symbols of the catholic churches led to the eventual resignation from the roman catholic church and his founding of the african-american catholic congregation which affirmed the african-american cultural and addressed the relevant needs of the african-american catholic communities communicants he subsequently established a national appeal for the Christians to declare a black church, black Christ. This became an effort that he initiated to encourage all black Christian congregations to discontinue the portrayal of Christ or other biblical characters in Caucasian flesh. For several years, he has held national conventions and campaigns to eliminate Caucasian images from black churches and black worship. Our scholars who address the social and psychological function, functioning of African-American people must take up this issue as one for their scholarship and research. African Jamaican cultural scientist and psychologist Leecham Simaj and others have done some preliminary investigations which demonstrate that young children have the conception that God is white. Such research critical in beginning to uncover the destructive psychological influences which distort our thinking and our living. Professional organizations dedicated to the unique problems of African Americans must take forthright positions on this issue as well as the American Medical Society is the voice of the authority on the health in Western world, the professional groups of African Americans must be the voice of authority on the mental, social, economic, and political health of African Americans. Such an effort has already been initiated by the National Association of Black Psychologists in a resolution which the world's largest organization of nine Caucasian mental health experts adopted in 1980. This resolution condemned the presence of, of Caucasian images of divinity as psycholog psychologically destructive to the minds of African Americans. Although the resolution passed with some difficulty, the slim majority which accepted it took a landmark stand against the most psychologically dehumanizing uh, and inferior, inferiorizing influence in society. There is a critical need for our experts to monitor more carefully the destructive influences in our physical, mental, social, and spiritual environments. The real challenge, however, is to remove the racial images of divinity from our own minds. 
The long-term subjugation to this image on a subliminal basis has deeply entrenched its influence in our perceptions. The subconscious internalization, which I mean, will make it difficult to recognize its influence. Developing an awareness that the influence of these images is there is a first accomplishment accomplishment and the social organizational of scholarly efforts described previously will facilitate this process but we must take self-affirmation steps to transform our own world we must carefully monitor the images to which we expose ourselves that perpetrate this destructive influence for example we might choose to refrain from uncritically watching a movie such as the bible which depict depicts the entire religious history of the Judeo-Christian world in Caucasian flesh. We must begin to build institutions which preserve the reality of our own experiences. We must begin to develop educational material, materials, artistic productions, economic structures, um, fashions, and concepts which deny the implication of our inferiority. Our religious leaders must help us to learn that God, Allah, Jah, Jehovah, Yahweh, deals with all of us directly. There is but one creator who has chosen all of creation within which to manifest his or her greatness. We have the same responsibility as any other people to develop our independent powers while interacting cooperatively with others. Dependence on others' resources, ideas, and creativity is not necessary when people come to recognize the same potential that the Creator has given to each of us. We do not need to beg anyone if we realize the value of gifts we have been given and begin to utilize them as others do in self-affirmative fashion. This realization and these efforts will equip us to begin the over, to overcome the last remaining stronghold on our psychological enslavement. Genuine emancipation of African American people would not be possible until every vertige of Caucasian association with divinity has been removed. Ultimate liberation does not involve substituting an African black racial image for the Caucasian one. Ultimate liberation recognizes that the form of the creator is a form superior to flesh, totally, and the perfected being invites us to a transformed state of, of perfection larger than material identity. Such transformation will never be possible so long as our aspiration is locked in the frame of material and deficient or incomplete form. <sighs> and that is the end of that book don't forget to tell your kids that god is black jesus is black whatever you believe in and don't forget to put on gracie's corner for them peace have a good day <laughs>